I host this, uh, this poetry show um, on Wednesday nights in Long Beach called the Lightbulb Mouth Radio Hour. And we interview authors and uh, musicians and such. And, um, and it's, it's in a bar, so it gets a little sloppy by the end of the night. But usually by the time the author's uh, interview happens, poor, poor, poor people. Um, but it's, it's kind of interesting. And I remember um, I was asking this author one of the questions, and I said, um, you've been given an uncommon superpower. What is it? And he goes, hmm. And a lady in the front row yelled out, spaghetti. <laughs> and I loved that she didn't say, you can shoot spaghetti from your eyes. Or every time you touch spaghetti, it becomes platinum or anything, it's just, spaghetti is magic. Um, I hope tonight feels like spaghetti for you because, um, God, wasn't Ruthie and Mike fantastic, everyone? <laughs> Stephen Kellogg's coming up after this. You guys are in for it. I hope you brought napkins. It's gonna be tasty. I'm gonna do a couple more poems, and um, these are from uh, I Love You Is Back, these two. Uh, this is called, uh, this is about sometimes benevolence is not the best idea and um, or it can lead you to strange revelations. This is called Recording Textbooks for the Blind. <clears throat> I had never gone inside the blind man's house before. I had, read, I, was, um, I had read his graduate textbooks on astronomy, Polynesian music theory, and strange mathematics into a tape recorder, all mumbled for him for five bucks an hour in Flagstaff. I thought it'd be nice to work from home and help but it dragged on me. After two hours of recording, I began skipping things that seemed unimportant to me. I would also add jokes that were not in the book. I would say, oh, look at this Polynesian naked lady doing something with a coconut, bleep, bleep, bleep. I never told him that I skipped some stuff. He couriered a message to me once to bring with my cassette a 40 watt light bulb and that I would be reimbursed. When I arrived, he asked me to help him replace it so he wouldn't get shocked. After a few seconds, I wondered why I was replacing a light bulb in his house. He said he could tell the difference. The place seemed cozy. I asked him if it felt like home. He said nowhere felt like home. I asked him the most pedestrian of questions. What is it like? He said, oh, living alone? It's not what I meant, but I listened. He said, when you are alone, you drink slower. He said he had a bottle made of bone and how different it felt on his lips compared to ceramic. He says when he speaks now, more often he means what he says. Of course, I wanted to know about living with blindness. I wanted to tell him I wrote a story about a time when I was an Easter bunny for some blind kids, as if that would make us feel bonded. But he mentioned that all he has ever learned about stars rolling in gas the sounds of Hawaii, various algorithms come to his brain as my voice. He said I was in his head and that when I spoke, he expected a load of random information to shoot forth. I kept moving my hand near him gently. I kept trying to tell if he could tell that I was looking at him. Standing there at his door, I tried to tell him how cold I was because I wasn't wearing a jacket. I must have sounded nervous, his record player dusty. Didn't know if I should tell him. I asked him one night, dropping off the cassette, what he dreamt about. He said each word crisply. Shapes. Mostly shapes. And a woman. How are my light bulbs doing? Thank you all so much for listening. I'm just going to do two or three more poems. And uh, uh, thank you for appreciating uh, poetry so much. This is, uh, this is exactly what I needed, ladies and gentlemen.